Welcome to another edition of the Civ Battle Royale. My name is Dawkins, and this is episode 24, Burning Fields and Eldritch Fears. Broken by war, many nations begin to collapse under the weight as the true method of warfare begins to reveal itself, and a dastardly scheme begins to take root. Starting on turn 366, let's get right into this. Hey there everyone, Lunar Needle here. Resident test man, professional leaker, and bug tester for Blue Cassette here with another hella exciting episode. I'm hella glad to be a narrator again, and I hope you'll have just as much fun as I do. Remember, I know the answers, but like any good role player, I'm good at playing dumb. That's right, he's playing. Cue the you're playing dumb comments now, so he beat me to it. We'll start with OC produced by Staunch Boat Mormon showing blatantly Venice propaganda. Like, come on, Dondolo definitely doesn't have muscles that big. We all know big boy Frederick will gladly size up those muscles with his impressive muscles he's labeled flintlocks. Oh yeah, and this image is hilarious. I wonder if these two will team up again in the future to prove which power can dominate Europe and contain the Eldritch Menace from South America. Varia has officially become too powerful. He cannot be stopped. With his maps being released an hour after the video, this man has achieved land speed record for mapping. Instead of the war map, which is insanely useful and you should check out on the sub, I'm opting to highlight a returning maximum extent styled map by user The Honesty Fish. This specific one highlights our largest upset of the Royale. Songhai truly spread their arms all over Libyan lands and controlled most of Northwest Africa before collapsing. It was an awful time to be a Songhai fan, but amazing if you are participating in the prediction contest. I received like 12 points over two parts. Nice. All right, guys, here is your mandated Uruguay fear campaign. Uruguay is definitely the big South American nightmare of this generation, and it's hard not to see why. With most of their competitors reluctant to expand due to territory, be it mountains, jungle, or Haiti, Uruguay has been allowed to expand and thrive. That matched with one of the best AIs in history, thanks Techno, possessing incredibly high expansion bias with sufficient naval biases as well to allow them to cross the South Atlantic Ocean for a chunk of modern day Ghana. And it's impressive and very scary. Adding onto that, they also have a seven tech advantage over Shikoku, effectively giving them an era advantage over their opponent. At this point, it'd take a coalition of civs at the end of the tech tree to dent the Uruguay menace. Be afraid. We begin this episode with units crashing into a rapidly dwindling Qing front. Shikoku was unable to advance due to a blob of units filling every tile in the Qing lands not three parts ago. However, now it seems like a round trip to the Qing city of Yin from Yangchen, which seems like a safe ride. Not one speck of damage crosses the cities though, so maybe Ying Zhang is viewing it personally before it becomes another production center for the Purple Patriarch of Punishment. In the notification panel, we see some interesting notifications. The first is an ideology being founded, however, even as Blue Cassette, it's a bit difficult to save loads at the moment. The second I get access, however, I will post an update on Reddit. The second notification, though, I don't need to save load to find out, and that is that Venice will peace out with the Holy Roman Empire, leaving them to Ulm in the Arctic and Brno in the ruins of the Czech Empire. Uruguay cannot help but to extend its control over Central America, potentially grinding the war to a stalemate by, somehow, having an anti-air gun parked right inside a Huexadzinco to encourage Venezuela to stop fighting, which seems to work. Don't tell the Navy about it though, they really don't like to stop fighting. That does make me wonder though, exactly how did the unit get in there? And does that make the city invincible to being captured without declaring war on Uruguay? A war declaration against Uruguay is a decision no one wants to make, even if there's a 781 defense Quikuro in between them and the big blue blob. 
Haida throws down the gauntlet and says that Siberia is not enough and that they are the rightful owner of the Qing's colonies. I like to believe the comics are spreading dissonance in the Qing's empire to stir their apathetic leaders into a war lust, only to find their disturbance greatly benefits the opportunistic leaders on the North American West Coast. This coast has little in the way of avenues of power and would require total exhaustion of soldiers around Wuchang and Changsha for any progress to be made. With a war on two sides, it's unlikely that they will be able to defend both their northern cities and their flank. Exciting times, folks. This is looking to be a hell of a part. Oh, those wars. No, those are irrelevant. What is interesting is that modern Madagascan naval troops are slowly thinning out Beta Israel's impressive and out-of-date navy. In fact, they're thinning it out so much that divisions of the army have deployed on the water to be of some assistance. It's a futile effort, and with each unit sunk, it's only a matter of time until, well, most likely an anticlimactic peace deal, but let's be honest about that. In a move no one saw coming, not even the people who analyzed the bonus slide we accidentally included in the part, or the momentary pictures in the DC, no one saw this at all. Indeed, it is so. That's it for Papua. They fought their hardest, and despite the warmongering penalties, New Zealand declared that this was their stand, and with a valiant strike, they blitzed Bunbury and Hohode down. These cities, destroyed by war, will not amount to much in the end of the game, but will mean the end of a fighter unlike any other. Papua, led by Raja Papua, was a powerful nation that came out of nowhere. An early settle by Sulu was thought to be the end, but they fought hard and took every opportunity, scoring most of Northeast Australia before being the linchpin into the death of Sulu mere parts ago. They will not be remembered as the nation who won, but they will be a stark reminder to never count someone out so early. The game can and will flip in, and in this case, out of your favor as the very friends who defended you either died in the case of Murray or murdered both of you in the case of New Zealand. I salute to you, my friend, F. Also, I'm just going to miss those colors. I wish Australia was neon green. Ostrava is almost down for the count as two suspiciously similarly colored neighbors get all too close with each other. If the HRE declared war right now, the city would be in their hands. But for now, they watch as Ostrava eventually becomes Palmyrene. In other news, Venice has riflemen in troves now. They're becoming quite a superpower. Could they finally fix the border gore that plagues Europe? I would love that. I want a purple Europe. Remember when people weren't blaming the latest Holy Roman Empire leader on being incompetent and the new leader was given a crap position? Well, they just gave away their beautiful Greenland city away to a civilization who would never be able to take that, leaving the once proud empire to one random city they, funnily enough, stole in a random peace deal unjustly. Actually, never mind about them being incompetent, they're just paying their karma dues before being ejected to the sub. In other news, Al Maria is definitely inundated with a bit of a pirate problem as privateers line the icy paradise. It's also a big paradise with more population than some of my big cities in multiplayer games. You go get them. The Métis might be improving slightly as their unit, the Coureurs de Bois, have arrived. I hope my French pronunciation worked. This unique unit replaces the Musketmen. It starts with the amphibious promotion, ignores terrain costs, and receives plus 15% combat strength when starting outside friendly territory, which, when fighting a defensive war, is pretty mediocre, other than flipping one of their own cities, which is never an envious situation. Thankfully, the unit also receives plus 1 movement and plus 15% defense when starting alongside a river, which, not as irrelevant to their arctic colonies, is still a nice enough buff. Here's hoping Matey can recover and use this unit to bounce back. In war news, it seems that units are beginning to fill the ocean around North Canada and have begun to assist the front around Mackinac. The Yupik might be running out of steam as the Matey unique unit clashes with Yupik swordsmen and artillery around Fort Pitt. Apache is bringing more than enough heat to sink any nation. 
With Enlightenment-era units rampaging through the countryside, knocking on Battleford, and using the staging ground of the Iroquois territory as a basin to funnel their units deeper into the core, it seems more so with each and every turn the mega empires of North America grow in size. One could hope the friendship doesn't lead to a Brazil-styled military takeover of Iroquois. Don't do that to my boys. They killed my sieve. They have to be worth respecting. <laughs> I, I implied that Canada was a bar that was hard to pass. I'm sad now. The Prussian unique units are filling out the territory of a surprisingly historically accurate Imperial Germany. Likewise to history, Moscow proves to be a road too far, as no civilization appears to be interested in accumulating the warmongering penalties. Elsewhere in this shot, Adirne looks pitifully defended and could be assimilated by Prussia post-haste. Meanwhile, the Goths are surprisingly strong in the navy and weak in the army, a unique look for them to be sure. The only thing I want to see is for Ostrava to fall. Like, the joke has run its course, come on. Submarines, competent armies, medium amounts of units and trading with India, another day in Japan for Shikoku. Happy of his Korean conquests, Shikoku might fancy themselves another feast, but their gaze turns to Chin and promptly says, no thanks. Maybe the navy bug has spread as sieves with woefully low naval biases continue to build more and more boats and less and less troops. Perhaps there's an enrollment issue. Perhaps the populace, after dealing with Canada and subduing Poverty Point, have become complacent. Still, I could imagine Haiti disappearing with this navy, something I definitely wouldn't say five parts ago. Or, I have another explanation. Could Big Carrier be infecting this round as well? The Logs of Justice were planted on the terrain, erecting more barriers for their neighbors but they failed to add in units to defend the newly acquired Songhai capital and new gains. Nevertheless, they are still a threat and could equalize Africa given enough time. The Cascos Azuelas have touched ground, the unique paratrooper replacement seen last part that can enter foreign territory without open borders, has 15% combat strength when outside Uruguayan lands. They also cost 20% more to build at first, but cities gain plus 1% production towards Cascos Azuelas for every unit in the territory of another civilization whom they are not at war with, up to 40%, making them roughly 20% cheaper to build. Thankfully, we added a resource cost of aluminum to keep them from owning the entire map, where this unit can and will shut down opponents before sucking them dry. Dare I say, the Salknum have been made into a cute puppet so the real eldritch horror can spread terror from the inside. Basically, good luck, Quikoro, is what I'm saying. Welcome to the Smackdown. In this corner, weighing in a lot of units with a surprising navy and a thirst for blood, it's the Iroquois! In the other corner, with a chip on their shoulder and enemies on all sides, it's the fighter, the one to top them all, the center of the rumble, it's the Apache. This is huge for the entire Royale, as this could potentially result in major border shifts in favor of the Métis, potentially weaken the complacent armies of both, and turn the American scene into one of blood and carnage. Frankly, I can't wait. Shish Inde was the first city brought down heavily on this front as the Iroquois were definitely prepared for this strike. Levering gunfire from their field guns and cannons, siege weaponry from the Enlightenment era, it's likely many cities will get low. However, without the many melee units to back them up, I have some doubt that Iroquois offense will bear fruit. Only time will tell. With armies crashing down on the city of Aolagaya, it seems unlikely that the Evenks will make any gains, already losing Yakesa to the blue wave across Siberia. I do, however, see a little momentum to push past Vanavera, unless they really bleed units across their entire empire. Meanwhile, the comics watch with popcorn in hand. Come on, guys, do the thing! Tripoli was such a powerful city back in the day, now reduced to a shell of what it was as it has acquired new management. The powerful Great Gallius looks onwards towards what could have been a much more beautiful color half a dozen parts ago. It's a wonder what would ignite this front again, and who would come out on top. 
I'll be frank, it won't go far, but Venice will still somehow lose. A Venezuelan gunner points to a siege weapon operator just southwest of Maracay. Dust grained into his skin as he reached for a revolver. He felt sweat beating down his skin. But before they could fire at each other, a loud test shot was fired in the sky from a nearby Uruguayan anti-air artillery. With a crack, they both look at each other and sigh. The siege operator just laughs. You still think they're smart by bringing just siege weapons to a war? Role play aside, holy hell is Uruguay stopping this war just as much as Venezuela doesn't want to win. I don't know if anything will come of this war with both peacekeeping units and a negligent amount of melee units. Shikoku, New Zealand, and Tongu are all next to each other before the modern era. Got that on paper. Also, Sulknam are there helping with cleanup. Good Eldritch Horror. For real, these cities are going to be Tongu's chance to become a major power. Meanwhile, I have large fear the Shikokan cities are just going to be pawns to be sacrificed for the sake of their main island should Tongo get big enough to threaten the mainland. But hey, it looks cool. Where did you come from? Just like that, an outdated army runs the front line. Sure, there's a pikeman staring down a rifleman, and sure, the cities are definitely not the bigger of the area, but dang, was that impressive. Yin is still slightly undefended, but it seems they might hold through sheer production and tenacity itself. Impressive. Ostrava has fallen, and with it, the sanity of mapmakers as they look at the borders of these two empires. Meanwhile, Czech life is now looking great as Venetian and Viking units fight side by side against Prague. Although none seem to dent the small wall of units, as if afraid that touching the city will make their AI worse. The HRE clearly got infected, giving away Ulm in a peace deal. Maybe they need sterilized gloves. The Palmyrene Empire looks to be one of legends, almost reforming the better Rome. There, I said it. I would mic drop, but I'm not talking. Dawkins is. Sad. And I'm not going to drop this mic, it's expensive. Now I see why Iroquois declared war. Holy heck, are the Apache a split up and weak nation, all things said and done. It seems unlikely that Chuk Anen and Shish Inde will hold, although I expect many flips for the latter due to the army in the area. Remember when I wanted to reduce carrier priorities? Well, good news! I'm pretty sure we did based on late game screenshots, but it still doesn't stop the husks of metal floating in the modern era. Just put that in your mind that Uruguay have carriers and paratroopers at turn 369 on historic speed. They are nightmare fuel and seemingly getting more powerful. The only benefit is that I imagine they are trade happy, allowing any neighbor to leech up to 20 plus science from trade routes, which definitely softens up the blow. Most likely due to this, Haiti has riflemen, which is a feat unto itself. Nice job, Haiti. It almost seems like they are in a unique world, as most civs are beginning to field more advanced ships in Europe and beyond. Privateers and other units seem to be content on floating around in the water, effectively a dinghy in the time of flight and atomic bombs. It's possible Uruguay can, with a key war, unlock their units to fight on the mainland, potentially in a coalition against Uruguay. But that's for the future. For now, any plans on the old world will be put on hold until the modern armors arrive in, like, two parts. Upon looking at this image, you might think, Wow, there's not much here, and you'd be right, so let's delve deeper. Uruguay seem to be friendly with Zimbabwe, meaning these giants should be safe for some parts. They are also fielding a small amount of modern infantry near Kindonga, the final stand of Nzinga. The most important part of the picture is the friendliness of Zimbabwe and the weak amount of army here. With a few thousand units, they can definitely be a horror, but like the boars before them, a new infantry unit might be not worth it compared to the shiny new research lab. Much like the carrier bug, it seems that if given the option to build useless boats, the AI would much rather do that than leave their core exposed. The Sami need to use their insane production in filling their lands or they'll... Well, nothing will happen. What do you think, the Goths would do some fighting? <laughs> no. The units slowly shift in position as the great hot potato game of 3090 AD commences. For my sanity, if the rifleman north of Prague dies, it'll most likely be a 50-50 flip. 
so this front will be interesting to watch. Personally, I would give it to Venice, as it would make future Prussian Wars interesting and give them a way to eliminate the HRE, making every map maker 44% happier. Don't ask where I got the percentage, classified information. Uh, so yeah, Madagascar and Arabia might become a thing, and considering Palmyra are running cross bowmen while Madagascar have their unique unit, I doubt it'll be as one-sided as we think. I still give it to Palmyra due to the army size, but damn Madagascar, you do you. Ah, the patented spread your army thin and run strategy. It would take a lot more units to make this strategy work, but despite that, I still give them the chance to capture Dezilk. The rest of the city's name is classified. In other words, the Yupik escaped with most of their cities they captured, allowing the Métis to focus their armies to the south and to the east. It's becoming a shit show. I brought drinks. Let's start a riot, said one man nearby Lund. The people at the nearby fish and chip stall looked at him weirdly and said it was dumb. He was so angered, he found a pointy stick and waved it around. He was then murdered by the Viking army and given a dishonorable burial shortly later. Rip. I think this is the point where Lunar had a mental breakdown because I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Oh, oh god. Aside from the absence of melee units, the sheer wall of Enlightenment era range units will make a mockery of the southern front. It seems like a straight shot from here all the way to the Apache capital at this point. It's about time you become an expert negotiator, Geronimo. When I was expecting unit spillover, I was not expecting this. Muscovite new units are being telefragged into a hellish arctic hellscape with no guarantee of survival. Minos watches from his personal scout boat with a chuckle. He was glad he didn't live long enough to witness teleportation being used against him. A bottle gets thrown at his head by a frustrated Paul Kruger. Too soon. Remember the Evanks? This is them now. You feel old yet? Evaporated is what I can call the Mighty Deer Army, and slightly annoyed is what I'd call the Kazakhs. It seems like the last units are forging a front line in a very Soviet formation. For now, bodies will block every bullet. But when will the bullets stop, and when will they come knocking? Is it time to prepare the coffin? Rumors on the sub stated that there would be three Asias. Three unique takes on the supercontinent. The Grey Asia states that the land will be full of ranged units and ships. This Asia would fight off all attempts to defeat them at all costs, while investing the production towards beautiful works of music. The Purple Asia believed in power, and thus summoned units capable of bringing cities to ruin and mass, however devoted they were to the fight or uniform their armies were. Marching in lockstep, they would move to one enemy and the next like a machine. They were predictable, calculated, and powerful. And the final Asia was the Red Asia, who believed in survival by enlisting the people. Every hand a weapon, even if it was woefully out of date. If you weren't a soldier, you were producing the grains to feed such an army. The Red Asia would never talk of the others, as they had been bullied many times before. And thus, with scraps, pikemen, and junk ships, they arranged in every single plot of land, hoping for the chance to defend themselves. Hmm. This doesn't mention the Brown Asia. I could have sworn that was important somewhere. Probably classified. Sometimes, when you have so many issues with happiness of acquiring a former aboriginal city and integrating it into your empire by force, you just ignore it by summoning an army to blanket the inhospitable hellhole that is inner Australia. Like, holy heck, I don't know if New Zealand could ever hope on taking Australia at this point. Mackinac is firmly in the hands of Yupik, and thus the development of the newer, sexier Alaska can begin. Seriously, this is huge. Like Alaska. Yupik was counted out just like Papua was, and just like them, they kicked a sieve that's 20 plus ranks over them. That's huge for the prediction contest metagame. But does this mean well for Métis that can now focus the bulk of their Arctic army down on the Apache? Has Geronimo made too many enemies? I guess we'll find out soon. The council concerning the ownership of Prague has begun, and as such it seems like all the Vikings and Venetians have pulled a South China Sea and claimed the same portion of land for themselves. 
One of you guys has to step down and let the other have it, or I'm letting the Holy Roman Empire capture it. Name a more iconic duo. Madagascar and capturing cities due to unit overflow. This is the biggest advantage AIs have, is that when they produce a unit, if there's nowhere to move it, it will just poof over to a nearby tile it can go to. Be it a hill nearby or a country 10,000 miles away, taking up their precious land. Turns out when said nation borders a weak nation, one opportune declaration of war can weaken them, fighting an enemy on a front they never expected. And as such, Salala is theirs. Good job, Madagascar. Gold star. Or, alternatively, you can use the aforementioned unit wall to distract a neighbor causing them to build land units instead of a navy and attack their weak coasts. Madagascar has been succeeding in places no other civilization should be able to. It's honestly amazing to see. I definitely want them to make it to the end game. Hiawatha is a genius. This army composition is enough to drain the army of the Apache, causing an eventual collapse of their front line while their highly mobile units can sweep in and take city after city with far stronger melee units coming in the form of riflemen. Shish Inde seems to fall and thanks to the Métis, it seems like Chul Anen will be next, be it Métis or Iroquois. Am I the only one loving that the only civs in Canada, United States, and Mexico are native civs with very satisfying borders? You got nothing for that. Literally nothing. You blundered it, you turned a flip into a flop. It has come to naughty. I've never heard that expression before. You've fallen flat. Your game has run aground. You've botched a perfect game. You've bungled a good situation. How many of these are there? You besmirched your name, besmirched my name, and turned my opinion of you quite foul. You failed. See me after class, Madagascar. That is all. Can you imagine your teacher telling you that? Madagascar built a carrier before building industrial era naval units. Is there no strategic resources? Quickly glancing at the map, there's at least like 50 coal. The only way they would not have any coal is if they had a lot of cities with fact. Oh, that's problematic. Nevertheless, they have some industrial era boats floating nearby Mandanda that look mighty menacing. Also, if you look off the east coast, what is Sulknam doing near those Zimbabwean units? What are they teaching them? Crashing down onto Iroquois from their acts of aggression is the peaceful Uruguay who, after engaging playful handshaking with Quikoro for dozens of parts, have opted to turn the North American natives into their next target. Fortunately for them, without declaring on Haiti, they will only be able to sail in small avenues to attack the core. It's safe to say this will be the only flashpoint for these two unless Venezuela gets serious in fighting the Haitians. Interesting times. Will anyone else declare war on the Iroquois? Here is your regularly scheduled OCP, that being Overflow Containment Project. This project is dedicated to containing units produced from civs with nowhere to go. Scotland, completely absent of a settler, just roamed the deserted wasteland of a frozen Greenland, looking for a new home. Uruguayans, however, got a message that they can attack their Greenland neighbors, moving out of the precious containment project to get some land with Dashi Bikau, striked down to half. Although, whether or not that's Uruguay or one of the many thousands of damages sources capable of damaging a city is anyone's guess. Maybe if Scotland strikes about now, they could capture Hake from the Apache, but that would never happen, right? After an eternity of them existing, the final reindeer archer grazes southeast of Baikit as a war rages on. Duo-chan, Ologaya, and Yakesa get flipped by a decisively competent strike force while the main bulk of Kazakh army groups around Paterana, most likely crushing opposition to their rule. Meanwhile, the war we'd all be waiting for with all the no people dying in it has ended. Canton can breathe a sigh of relief. Yin has taken damage, probably as negotiations between the Twin Asias comes to a close. It's about time that Shikoku moves into place as the defense is thinning more and more. Yet again, I said that before, so expect this land to be full of crossbowmen in two turns. The Iroquois once more flip the city of Shishinde, no doubt heavily damaging the core of Apache. 
It seems unlikely that anything major will come out of it due to the surprisingly heavy coalition of melee units hitting the front line against the Iroquois. I expect for their unique unit to be making a showing sooner rather than later, but that's getting ahead of myself, isn't it? I'm amazed at how strong the hold on a lot of Oceania that New Zealand has, but I'm disappointed by the choice of units. There's many privateers, skirmishers and ancient era boats cruising next to Renaissance era boats. It's not an impressive array of units to be honest. I could honestly see most major civilizations making a sizable dent to their navy and ultimately taking victories off King Dick himself. Tananyokan is down due to the surprisingly high amount of privateers, while Huexo Cinco seems safe due to mediocre unit composition on the front line, with a high amount of Gatling guns and field guns running to the city to die. Seems hella likely that due to the Aztecs' higher than average amount of melee units, that they will flip cities non-stop, even if they are swordsmen. They make the Uruguayan infantry nearby seem damn near future era in comparison. If Aztecs want to survive, they need to find any way to end open borders now before it's too late. While the world burns, the Songhai cities of old become puppets to the Moorish people, no doubt forcing the Moors to buy units in all of their cities to help defend against a potential war with Benin. Although, that might be because they have obsessions with unit carpets. I mean, it worked against Algeria, Libya, and Songhai. What's a few more hundred thousand units to the fire? I hope New Zealand's proud, because with their most recent acquisition of small formerly Papuan cities makes them a new target. With a pretty much secured Australian continent by the big green blob and a mostly secured Oceania by the Tongu, it seems that the small microcolony would be likely to be swallowed up as the eventual war to decide Oceania would occur. For now, they wait and build the ever-strong riflemen, hoping the additional city defense it creates would manage the mega-nations to fight each other. And yes, I know New Zealand is big, but they are a paper tiger. A war against Tongu or Australia might mean New Zealand will shrink down to just their main islands. Mark my words. It seems that with the 15th kill from the submarine hosted in Gaianius, got enough kills to get a multi-kill. Kill, 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 allowing a single melee unit to swoop in and take the city. This unit was so happy it proceeded to fly directly into the gaping maw of two Uruguayan privateers. Oh well, you win some, you lose some. Meanwhile, there's some more pressing issues on the sidebar. Kamugs were awoken by the Tongu, who wanted to rain hell on their neighbors as plans in Oceania begin to bear fruit. While Tongu could send a navy over, it seems most likely that this is an attempt to weaken the Kamugs and cause a war in India with Indira on the losing end. A tactful move, but from my knowledge, it seems like this is likely to go nowhere through the mountainous terrain of Asia. Nevertheless, awakening the Kamugs might be the scariest part. Avenks, Kazakhs, Chin, and Ching should take note with worried eyes. Another city flip on the Apache and Iroquois border is one thing, but with units beginning to ignore the Aztecs and focus on punishing the few units unwise enough to set sail, it seems all is normal. I can see the impressively ranged unit selection down the Venezuelan coast, which has me wondering if we should prime our respect keys. Maybe a few more parts, but with Uruguay filling all tiles, is that wise? Remember when Tonga had these islands off the coast of Atarco? Remember when they burned them down just to prevent their unhappiness from affecting their pop-heavy centers? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Meanwhile, a Reformation belief got founded. I'm potentially just going to go into a nearby save when the part is aired just to get all of this information, as this frustrates me. Although, there might be a turn or two leaked for ideologies, so watch out for that. While it seems that the Qin have all their guns in an order, the choke point of Beijing seems to be an impossible hurdle to cross, with most units stuck in the capital cities while archers and musket men hold off the ever-encroaching grape Kool-Aid warriors. Hashtag not sponsored, but if Kool-Aid wants to sponsor this, they can go right ahead, that'd be cool. In other words, Uruguay has begun to assimilate Montezuma with way too many units. Meanwhile, Madagascar wants to do the same to Benin. I'm beginning to think the Brazil strategy got leaked somewhere. Maybe Selkum carried the technique to Uruguay, who brought it through an Algerian day to Madagascar. 
Maybe Pedro is seeking control from Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe it's all too late. That or Uruguay is stupidly overpowered. I can't tell. The Soknam seem to be having happiness issues as Uruguay begin pouring unique units into them, gaining production cost advantages with each unit that floods peaceful ally lands. I imagine the geopolitics of Soknam and Uruguay are unique enough to make a Netflix show and four novels on the drama. I wonder how user The Honesty Fish and user One Half Cup Flower and user Jay Mangelo and... Are we becoming a hub for writers? Dang, that's pretty nice, not gonna lie. Let's also not forget user Catalan Man, author of the CBR novel. Scotland, what are you doing? Imagine them just watching as Prague begins to collapse from being surrounded by Viking guns, Venetian guns, and Nanettes? Don't know what that is. Just imagine if they declared war right now. There's only one melee unit left from the Czech. Just imagine a random small empire getting a random Central European city. That has never happened before. <laughs> Tibet. <laughs> My complicated lore is getting more complicated. Who taught Maratha the art of unit spam? This also will showcase the only major front of the Kamlug Indian war front. I admit in saying I am underwhelmed. This will just serve to be an annoying meat grinder. A shame, really. Maybe if Maratha declared on the Khanate, that would be interesting. And that's saying something. With the advent of flight and very few anti-air mechanisms in place aside from the Uruguayans, this will be happening a lot more often. That being said, if that production was used on something like units, then maybe they can do something with that air power. Oh, AI, never change. Chuk Anen flips again, but something just hit my eyes. Why is there glowing green hills? Am I missing something, or does that look like nuclear waste being dumped? Hmm. Apparently that's an effigy mound I haven't noticed until now that cannot be pillaged from a civilization called Poverty Point. Isn't that a city? Never heard of them. In other words, it seems likely that the flips will continue up until the capital. Iroquois are ruthless, but I can see a peace deal coming up about now. Mark my words. It might seem hella unlikely, but I believe one of the units up there is a melee Uruguayan in the mess above. Don't call it a comeback, but I'm saying this might actually turn into something. Maybe. Also, come on, Poverty Point, do it for me. It's about that time that continents are made, everyone. I warned you that this episode would be interesting, and as Balancob is once more struck from above by planes and from a small smattering of units, it's time we find out who is worth it in Africa. I expect this exchange to weaken both empires, but ultimately be given to the superior Zimbabwe. But only time will tell. Just exactly what did Selknam tell you? And why were Algerian workers in days there? What did you tell them, Nyatsimba and Matota? Sure, snipes are really cool and hilarious, but these distant cities will do very little for the strength of the empire and only make you more of a target. How many declarations of war were entirely due to eliminating Nadongo? Was it worth it? Meanwhile, Uruguay looks on in jealousy as they no doubt begin construction on the 500th wonder. Priorities, I suppose. The night nearby Bakhtapur panicked as they hear boss music. Over the hills rides a Marathan field gun, confirming the rumor that indeed Maratha and the Kazakhs have declared war. Both of these wars potentially threaten their far-flung cities like Pokhara and are definitely on the table. That, or some units can take damage and nothing happens. That too. Also, Nepal declared on the Kazakhs, a probably meaningless war for now due to the land problems innate in northern Nepal. For real, if I may inject, who here expected a lot of better things from Nepal? They were nightmare fuel incarnate and here they are, long and skinny with crap land and no way to really break out onto the main stage. As nice as Maratha is, would we have a more competitive cylinder if Nepal controlled all of Marathan land or no? Am I wrong? Sound off in the comments on the Reddit or in this video, I guess. I mean, I expected it, but boy oh boy does it hurt. Story time with Lunar, everyone. I put my cards entirely behind the check. I love their basic but powerful mod design. 
I thought they had pretty good colors, and they were positioned against mediocre AIs. Sure, I expected one of them to still be alive, but I didn't expect the person to bring them to their doom was the one city challenge Civ from Firaxis. What a tumble. The Czech were marred by peace deals, split into two, and forced to remain a rump while all the land on the outer of Europe was consumed. In the end, their relevance was held down by the Ottoman Empire and held down even further by their options shrinking away. Despite the oversized Europe on Seabrix's map, it was not enough to give civilizations with mediocre AI and amazing uniques a chance to shine. They died a slow death and got placed in an unwinnable situation. Nothing more to say than that. F. Well, let's all give it up for the Czech for capturing Constantinia, because that was pretty awesome. So long, the Czechs. Check you later. With the resistance around the Iroquois fleet shrinking as a privateer battle rages on outside, Ganeus falls to the might of the Uruguayan navy. The submarine casually strikes down boats unwise enough to step in their effective range, but even these boats cannot do anything against submarines, leaving open season for these naval captains. It might suck to lose two cities, but think of the killstreak of striking down wave after wave of Uruguayan naval vessels. That should be enough to get the bomb killstreak, right? Is it cold yet? Because I think it's about time we got nuclearly serious. The Algerian Day, transporting the information from Uruguayan laboratories to the floor of Zimbabwe scientists, have discovered the power of the atom, the opening of the dragon's maw and the flame of God. Nuclear weapons have reached Africa. Belenkab might be the first of many testing grounds. Let's keep our eyes peeled. Oh boy, it seems like the defense that crumbled mere slides ago seemed to completely deteriorate. I even see the navy that held back Shikoku parts ago is also in shambles. It's likely whatever army composition that the Qing have is in shambles with esteemed generals and admirals going every day. So basically what I'm saying is, imagine what it's like in Beijing. Iroquois might be using early industrial era units, but it seems like modern naval warfare with the rockets flying around. This is a major advantage of our recording methods, is we can capture the cool things you'll never see in Endgame, like the shot down plane after Uruguayan attacks on the Iroquois Navy. Truly, we're in a unique age. Less importantly, it appears that the Navy that both empires had managed to successfully sink each other leaving this area of the world surprisingly empty. Well, as empty as you can call the ocean. Something interesting to note is that I made the assumption on the Kazakhs that friendship was evident between the comics. There were units in Patan and that Marantha wasn't carpeting their lands for them. Friendship has painful consequences though, but seems unlikely that any of these cities will be seeing any wartime fire. If you want to make a well-defended mountain city your last vestibule as Maratha runs at you from all sides, make it earlier than later, Prithvi. In other words, I expected nothing of the comics war and I'm still underwhelmed. Perhaps strong use of planes might change my tune, but it's hard to fight in one-tile gaps. Jeez, people are not having a good day at all. Everyone appeared to co-sponsor a massive Stop Being Bad letter and mailed it directly to Ivan. Someone appeared to scribble down a declaration of war. Every Civ just shrugged and let it happen. Noticing this injustice, Nepal quickly sued for peace, wanting to be as far away from the conflict as possible. Good on you. Absolutely ravaged with hundreds of thousands of people slaughtered as Zimbabwe rolls up their lockstep troops through the former Israelite city, threatening to push forward. Desperate, some dudes on a sailboat approach the city, ready to enact justice with a musician in tow. Perhaps they were a barbershop quartet fishing crew turned soldier crew with baby on board named the B Flats. I don't think they can capture a city with a net, but goddamn they'll be in harmony while trying. Striking down the front line eager to defend their home, the Apache a unique unit strikes into the fray, replacing the cavalry. This unique unit ignores zone of control and has increased flank attack bonus. If they attack a military unit stacked with a civilian, the unit is killed, receiving a massive heal and experience boost. While it might not be a while until that happens, workers and even great generals can be medkits powerful enough to keep the heavily targeted unit alive. Dare I say this defense force is powerful enough to hold back the Iroquois? 
Can we be seeing a comeback? While the war front has pushed hard against the Iroquois with an impressive line of units, the lack of formation has a break in the lines, causing Frog Lake to begin to be surrounded while the Zilt has been pushed into matey hands. Just south of the city is the other powerful unique unit of the Renegade. This unit replaces the Rifleman, has no cost to pillage, and can enter another Civ's territory without open borders like the Uruguayan Paratrooper. As they acquire promotions, they get a free survivalism promotion equal to their higher shock or drill promotion. For those of you unaware, survivalism is a scout promotion granting up to 50% defense and plus 10 HP per turn while also healing after every turn. In addition, it also allows the unit to retreat, which is likely for deity civs to have. Basically, this is strong as heck. You know, in my entire time thinking of who would declare war on the Papuan Slayers, I was not expecting Shikokuf to be the one to be the Shikok upset. Running down with submarines next to dinghies is a unique strategy, and one that due to the absolutely piecemeal military that New Zealand has might work. I don't expect much gains beyond Masterton, however, as New Zealand has enough production to keep up with the long-range naval warfare, right? Tongu is beginning to spill into the front line, protecting the region from any wars. They insist that any war fired in this region must be approved entirely by user Emerald Range. And considering I'm narrating, they have to wait for him to be available. I'm just saying facts here, folks. Expect any wars here to grind to a halt aside from potentially a naval war from Parthia. Jeez, I'm resorting to awful puns. Is this what I've succumbed to? Alas, pun aside, it seems that Pokana is gone. They retreat their army to the natural choke point that India and Tongu tiles have created, probably going to hold the line there, which all is said and done is a very good idea. I'd do that and potentially declare on India as a human player, as Delhi being defended by pikemen and crossbowmen is too good to pass up. Purple Haze floats into Jiangning, bringing all the former Qing cities into a deep, dark red. It seems likely that some of these cities will be flipping for the last time. I imagine some of these cities built two flagpoles and merely raised the flag of the occupying force when they enter. Don't worry, flag lad. It'll be over soon. Crashing waves and crashing boats will be the only thing that the Pacific will see for the next couple of parts, as many seafaring nations declare war on one another for dominance. In other words, a surprising navy force bears down on Hawaiian holdings, while a few units distract the Shikokan defense fleet with a small smattering of ships. I wonder if New Zealand really have the firepower to defend and attack at the same time, though as those ships assaulting the Japan proper need to be at home, defending. With a surprisingly large assortment of units, it seems they are dedicated to potentially flipping Tosha Shimizu, which, while seemingly dumb initially, if they can flip it, they might be able to sue for peace, giving the city back and returning it to the status quo, or potentially even retaining the city. It's dumb, but I admit, I've done it before in a few high-difficulty games as a player. The problem comes in holding the city. Can they do it if it flips? Well, we'll just need to see. Nepal managed to make a surprisingly strong push, pushing away the Marathan overflow and beginning to bear down against the Kazakhs. Was this the reason war was declared to get rid of border gore? This coming from the longest boy in the cylinder. I admit, I am impressed at the tenacity of For Better Maps. Maybe Nepal are some of the best cartographers out there and control the political sphere to make sure maps look far more appealing. Map makers and professional map painters everywhere salute them. India and Tongu square off in the oceanic waters as Madagascar looks on in awe. Well, that's about it. I'm going to devote this slide to talking about Endgame now. For those unaware, Endgame is a solution to late game deadlock. A game crash after a long series of inactivity due to this very ocean being a garbage pile of every Civ units meant that we were given no choice. Remake the game, call a winner, or make a new game to declare the winner. We chose the last option, and thus, Endgame was born. Endgame will take all the relevant stats and give appropriate buffs to civs in reflection on how they performed in the previous game. To make the game almost definitively finished, 
We shrunk the map to account for the lower participants, and we're starting again from turn one. It gets better, because this means in future seasons we won't have any excuse to post ten turn parts anymore, and every season we'll have a champion. No more skipping on to the next season like was done in Mark 1, and before we stepped in, Mark 2. We make each episode exciting for you to watch, so stay tuned. It's amazing how fragile Korea looks, with its new capital, Gangyang, only one tile away from the Shikokan Navy. In more pressing news, it seems like nothing happened on the Apache and Métis front with the peace deal, but yet again, I could be missing some random island city somewhere. We'll be returning there shortly, but that must be disappointing for a Métis fan, who got a major boost in combat potential after the Yupik peace deal, meaning they only lost land in this prolonged fight. This is possibly the worst peace deal, maybe in the history of peace deals ever. Tongu seemed to allow New Zealand to partner with them after the Papuan elimination, making this all the more confusing as they rampaged down Sasaki. This seems likely to hold, especially if the rifleman positioned on the city moves one tile off. It seems like Shikoku is losing. But they also let Shikoku move through their lands. Good on you for being so good, Tongu, but this is a troubling thing to do. Open borders have had disturbing, awful effects in the past, so be careful. The Statue of Liberty This was the wonder positioned in Agra in Mark 2.1, built in an unknown city for now in Australia. This is huge for the production boost of Australia. If anyone wasn't sure why they want freedom, this huge building will mean that even if they become autocratic, they will have a production advantage as their hyper-large cities get ever bigger. On this slide, we see Nepal for now holding the line as Gatling guns and only Gatling guns line the border. This is an amateur mistake, Maratha. You're better than that. Or maybe they aren't. I brought up earlier how Nepal is considered one of the best AIs on the cylinder, and yet they seem to be losing to one of the less impressive AIs on the cylinder. It's very likely this obsession with range units could be the preventer of an obviously capturable city remaining unjustly in Nepalese hands. Only time will tell. I stand corrected. Indeed, it seems like... That's the native tongue was given to the Métis in exchange for peace. Proving to be a small but noticeable advantage to Métis and the cities they gave to Yupik were only providing negligible yields and only having small strategic importance. I'd say in the end, the Métis are in a good spot to benefit the most. Now if only Ontario was a more fertile battleground. And that's it for the part, folks. I narrated this in a few days and had a blast doing it. I've probably made many mistakes as I am more so a role player than a professional writer. So if I made any mistakes, you can wag your finger at me in the comments, and I'll correct anything I can. As I said in the narration, I will try to save load with my current mod setup to see if I can get ideology and wonder locations. Keep hype, folks, and see you next time. P.S. In before someone tries to analyze this entire narration for ARG clues. Mmm, Illuminati. And my name is Dawkins. This has been me narrating this audio narration again this week. If you liked it, please like and subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your parents. It is Thanksgiving after all in the United States coming up, so just make that the center of conversation while you carve into a turkey or tofurkey wherever you're from. It's been my pleasure to talk at you this time around, and until next week, we'll see you next time.